What about when you were younger writing, when you were writing in between bartending gigs or, you know, in between writing songs and starting to write screenplays? Who was your audience then in your head? What was motivating I mean, you to I was, get up and just You're through? hungry, man. You want to get over. I mean, I was, had no money. I wanted to be, you know, I, was, I attended bar during the Reagan years and watched all these, you know, the, the rise of, of, the, of the, you know, of Wall Street and the yuppie class and all that. I mean, I was watching all these kids get rich and fill it. You get, I was very motivated to, 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 you know, writing out of anger and writing out of, you know, get me out of here. Um, I don't need the money so bad anymore. It's a different thing. But I am motivated by different things than I was then. It was really trying to, you know, was really trying to get over. You really want, that's when you're young and strong and you need to use that because you're not that, you're not wise and you make mistakes and, right. you know. Well, I, for me, it was like that no one in America really understood how crazy the situation in Northern Ireland was. And, um, and I felt that there was this, you know, there was this sort of romantic Celtic sort of mist over here. And, and, I, and I had this bizarre situation where, you know, I'd been in, in a prison and, and particularly with the tunnel, the play that it was so bizarre because we, it, we were in this compound, we dug this tunnel and it's the worst thing ever. It was like, this was literally, you couldn't get through it. You could barely get your head through and there was like 13 people in it passing dirt between them and if it fell and it fell all the time you had to pull them out it was it was a grave that went along and no but nobody thought of of getting a compass so we started dig <laughs> we started this is true we started digging this tunnel towards these walls and as soon as we started, it turned out as soon as we started digging, we started veering. This is the great process metaphor you're That's looking right. at. Yeah, exactly. no, but it, it, well, it actually this became a, more, a metaphor for Northern Ireland because, <laughs> because we, we, we had almost, we dug our way out and almost dug our way back in again when the fucking thing collapsed uh, like the third week of it. And somebody stuck their head up and looked and the, the fence, we were supposed to be under the wall and the fence uh, of the compound was right there. So I wrote a play <laughs> basically about these guys who were trapped in this prison and who were trying to dig their way out. And metaphorically, they were just digging their way back into... Their, it, was, it was a metaphor for Northern Ireland itself. And um, to get that out, to write that and think that would be a clever play, and when I took it to Sheridan, he liked it, and the Irish Art Centre was, you know, the 40-seat theatre where if you had four people in the play, you, you were losing money, um, and put it on. Uh, and then, so the whole thing of writing drama was just to try and explain what was going on there, and then I realised, um, after working in journalism a bit, that particularly the Jerry Conlon story, it, it was universal in that the good father searching for the bad son and, you know, the, the judicial system that was corrupt that was putting these people away. So it was always to find a universal story within this bizarre place that I knew. Um, and, and that kind of became what I've looked for all the time, in non and particularly in nonfiction. I mean... Well, there's a quality that adds to, to both of your work is kind of characters based on life and, you know, stories based on kind of instinct other than movies, just based on movies. There are people who can write good scenes or clever sort of visual moments and clever shots and, and the studios get it and read it and they're reading these scenes and shots and they're like, oh, fuck, man, this is great, this is great. And, and before they know it, they've bought the script and it's on the blacklist and everybody's saying it's wonderful. And then a week later, they get the start. They sit down and they actually read the thing, and it doesn't make any sense. And and next thing, they're calling up us, and we're brought in, and we say, "This doesn't make sense here, lads. You know, okay, it's a great scene here, and that's wonderful, and this sounds good, and all the rest of it." But the pizzazz of it all has taken over, and the structure and the logic and the the empathy of the audience has gone out the window, and it's just a good read. A good read is not a good fucking film by far, you know? And you can, you, there are people, there are writers out there who are producing great reads and making a lot of money, and when it comes to actually putting it together, it all falls apart. 
and then the script doctoring is brought in and and you see all these holes and you try to fix it and then they say well it's lost the swagger but the swagger's in the fucking read it's not in the in the in the in the, in the hole would you agree with that or what not to blow his trumpet again but Tony Keep going, can, man. Tony can, com <laughs> can combine the both. Every movie presents its own. Um, every one of them is always its own, uh, its own, its own issue. Um, it's like when I come to do rewrites of these big scripts, I can't get past the moment where Angelina Jolie goes into a cell and turns in a turns a fluorescent tube into a rocket launcher and fires it at a wall, and get, I'm like. Nah, I, can't, I literally can't get past that. How the fuck did she do that? So I, al I always need to like find a motivation in my head. And sometimes with the, the way films are made now, you're, you're, I don't make leaps of imagination. You know, I need to have the chain of logic working through it, which is actually not a good thing in today's script writing, script doctoring. <laughs> Yeah, but within te within what Terry said, I mean, look, you, we we have both. I mean, but that's the good thing about Born. You know, the the only leap of imagination they take in Born is that he can kill you in an elevator. You know, other than that, he doesn't turn you know a pocket watch into a Ferrari and get away. <laughs> you know, I'm doing that now actually. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's it, Born like gets a newspaper and kills you with it. That's about it. Other than that, <laughs> it all works, you know? Whereas everything else in the great fantasy world of it now is that it becomes a solution to a problem in the script. Oh, let's get this fluorescent tube and blow a hole in the wall. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, I can never, I'll take a script to rewrite and, I'll, and I've made a lot of stupid decisions over the years where you you know, you read something, and before you've had two days to really think about it, you've already started a conversation, and the movie's yeah. so desperate, and you're on the movie, and then you wake up the third day, and you read what you've signed on to do, and, and I always end up doing, you know, everything, which is always way too much, because I really can't. I've never successfully been able to come in. I've been able to come in and, and, and fix a scene in a film or write a scene for two people. Someone say, this is what the scene's about or this is what... I've never been able to write a section of a film or a part of a film because I just can't... If, you're, if it doesn't come from mm -hmm. absolute legitimate behavior and legitimate reality, I'm, I'm, I'm screwed. Now, I, my whole effort over time is I'm trying to make imaginative work be that thing. That's my little crusade is always to try to... How can I make the science fiction movie that Terry doesn't want to do, how can I make it so it actually is, my God, it really completely makes sense. I mean, Well, if you're, as the writer director, it's because just you, go so with, you go in there, I don't know. Because I'm going to be, out of, six months yeah. from now, I'm going to be like, I know. what do I say? What do you say? You I'm, say it was free. I'm in Alaska, yeah. I'm dying, I haven't but slept it's a, in three it's a weeks. Wonderful, it's a social thing, you're in it's this social. crowd and you're God, and you know, you hold out your hand, there's a fucking cup of coffee there, and you hold out this, and, and you say everyone whooshed, and they all get up, and it's great. And, and, and if you have written the thing, then you know well, if this doesn't work, or you pull this card out of the house of cards, I can fix it. Now, when you come to direct something that you haven't written and you have doubts about, and you get in there and the house of cards starts falling down, that's a whole different kettle of fish. I don't know how people find a script and go off and direct it. And I have to conceptualize it. You well, know. we've also watched so many directors fall underneath movies that they didn't understand. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, it's funny. This I just directed a thing um, that you didn't understand. No, I understand. Oh. <laughs> well, it was David. David Mills wrote it, you know, and it's it's like, it's. Uh, I didn't understand it actually half the time. Well, there you go. <laughs> but I got the whole concept of it, and it was great writing, and and I was into it, and it was it wasn't that bad. But if you run into a story that doesn't work, and you can't fix it yourself, you know, there's a, somebody else there who's trying to fix it, and you're trying to say it to them, and then it becomes painful, you know. You know, if they don't understand this in Peoria, we're fucked. And that's it. If, if, if Ro Hotel Rwanda doesn't play as a universal story, then we haven't got it. And how can you take that? And, and I think just to expand on what Tony was saying, the, the, the whole process is, 
um, he talks about the cartoon and sketching it and drawing it. For me, the metaphor is, is carving a piece of wood. You start off with a chunk of wood, and you chip away at it and chip away at it, and you end up sandpapering it down till it's this, you know, as, as perfect as you can get, shiny and varnished. And you just, with a script, you've got to do that. With a novel or a book of nonfiction, you can expound and show your genius at writing and all. With us, it's, it's sandpapering all the time. And the more you sandpaper at it, the more you whittle it down. It's the, and, and with nonfiction, it's sort of, it's the brandy or the cognac of wine. It's the distillation of a, a nonfiction story down to its, its cognac down to the, that, that essence that will capture the event itself in two hours or an hour and a half or whatever it is for an audience. And I remember when In the Name of the Father came out, I was sitting in Jim Sheridan's house and the Daily Telegraph, which is a, a very right-wing uh, British daily paper, called them up. And I knew they were starting to get on about the veracity of the story and all. And, and he said... No, this is a greater truth than the truth itself. And I'm like, oh, oh that's us. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, that was like, these guys think they're telling a greater truth. You've got to sit down and write down the events and hold true. You can't invent your own truth. You've got to distill the truth. Well, now, so the film that was made about Rwanda needed to play in Peoria. You couldn't get anything more bizarre than Rwanda. Um, and yet you had the metaphor of the, the good hotel manager who was trying to keep the inn and keep everyone safe within it. So it, it, that, it, it came from growing up in an extraordinary political environment and spotting those characters that, that were universal. It, I guess one of the last things I wanted us to talk about is do we have a responsibility and how does that play? My, my son found this quote, I hope this is right, you'll let me know, that you said that the penetration that Hollywood achieves in Africa and Asia is huge, uh, almost like surrogate uh, immigration. Clearly, the values of America and the West are spread in particular by movies and television. I'm not sure that's such a good thing. No, I'm, I'm, I'm totally sure it's not a good thing. It's just because I remember driving through Rwanda and... Um, at a particular village, we were going to visit the, you know, go see the gorillas, which is the main uh, form of tourism and the economy. And we came to a village, and and there were a bunch of young guys standing around, and they were watching the TV. And there was about 20 of them standing there, and they're watching 50 Cent with a bling bling, and he pulls up in the Cadillac, and the uh, and the disconnection between these guys who. This was, this was their life, to just hang around this corner. You know, they clearly, there was no work in the place. They probably, it was a, a Hutu village. You know, their parents were probably either in jail or fled. And, and here we're presenting this image of what life should be to them. You know, the, the bling and the chicks hanging around and all that. And I'm thinking, fuck, this is... What message is this given to these guys? One of the big problems they have in South Africa is they have an immigration swell as well. And it tends to be boy soldiers from Central Africa or from Mozambique who come into the townships. And these kids have slaughtered, like they have killed uh, and been involved in wars of which we have no concept. You know, Tupac is a big image for them and all the, the, the whole violent hip-hop side uh, has migrated there and it has found a resonance among kids who have suffered the worst possible um, experiences that we can't even imagine. And these guys are now immigrating. They're immigrating south and they're immigrating north to where the money is. Like, what was the guy Willie Horton used to say? You know, where, why well, do you rob banks? Because that's, well, where, the that's where the money, money is. is right. yeah. that's, so, so, and that's, that's what we're passing on to whole, a whole generation across Africa and Asia. And I think we're going to reap the whirlwind over. This is not the image to, to be passing on to the world, you know?